Asia Families is a non-profit organization that reaches out to help Korean adoptees and adoptive families in the U.S. Today we have Grace Pagang Song, founder and executive director of Asia Families, in our studio. As she is visiting Korea as part of her annual summer visit with Korean adoptees. So all of these questions uh, can be answered by someone who went through that journey. Uh, I think it's meaningful connections that parents and children can make in our community. On today's Heart to Heart, we will find out about Asia Families, an organization that engages in meaningful activities between Korea and the U.S. Asia Families is a non-profit organization that reaches out to help and support Korean adoptees and adoptive families in the U.S. I am pleased to welcome Grace Hwagang Song, founder and executive director of Asia Families. Hello and welcome to Heart to Heart. Thanks for joining us today. Hi, nice meeting you and thanks for invite, inviting me here. Oh, thank you for coming. Uh, would you like to say hello to our viewers that are watching and also uh, tell us about the organization in more detail? Sure, hi, um, my name is Grace Song and I'm the founder and executive director of Asia Families. We are a nonprofit organization based in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. We've been serving adoption community over the past 10 years. Uh, widely, um, mainly in Washington, D.C., but we also serve adoptees all over in U.S. I see. So you have been doing this for, for 10 years, mm -hmm. since 2009, mm -hmm. yeah, for quite some time. Uh, could you tell us about the programs or activities offered by the organization? Yeah, Asia Families offer a few main programs, mm -hmm. uh, starting with the Korean Culture School, uh, which is a monthly gathering for young and teen adoptees and their families. We also offer annual family camp called mm -hmm. Camp Rice, which is a sleepover camp in a nicely uh, located uh, wooded area. We also offer annual um, Korean uh, motherland tour uh -huh. called Korea Bridge Tour. So we come and visit every year with um, some adult adoptees and family members. Okay. And the Korean Culture School sounds like a great opportunity for you know adoptees to learn about the Korean culture and do much more. So please do tell us about that program. As yes. Well. Um, so when the organization founded, the uh -huh. first program we ever launched it is called Korean Culture School. The school is designed to teach and support Korean adoptees in U.S. Mm -hmm. to learn about Korean heritage and their birth culture. Uh, we offer, we make, we try to make the Korean culture fun. <laughs> so we bring Korean cooking classes, oh. drumming, fan dance, art and craft, paper folding. So the children are engaged, mm -hmm. finding interesting about Korean culture. Uh -huh. And while parents uh, get to learn about their children's birth culture mm. uh, at the same time, it's for whole family, whole family experience. I see. What do the parents say they like most about uh, this program, the parent sessions? I think it's they love coming to culture school uh -huh. because their children love coming to our mm. program. It's just everybody looks like themselves and uh, adoptees come, they're loved. Mm -hmm and no one is questioning why your last name is different, you know, doesn't look like, doesn't sound like a Asian name. Right. So um, seeing, as a parent, seeing your children enjoying something mm -hmm. means the most. <laughs> At the same time, they get out so much out of mm -hmm. it too. Mm -hmm. um, for instance, you know, often we put together adult adoptee panel discussions mm -hmm. where some adult adoptees share their adoption journey uh -huh. with the parents. And parents get to ask questions, you know, um, when do we begin search for mm. their birth family? When do we first travel to Korea for the first time? So all of these questions uh, can be answered by someone who went through that journey. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. um, I think it's meaningful connections that parents and children can make Absolutely. in our community. Yes, wow, very much. Um, I understand that you sponsor a two week long Mm -hmm. Asian families tour. It's uh, about 10, 11 days, 10, 11 but days. we have extension to Jeju Island, ah. which I'm very excited about. We are leaving tomorrow. Uh, which places have you visited so far? So we came to Korea with my tour. Participants uh -huh. arrived about um, 10 days ago. Mm -hmm. We started sightseeing Seoul. 
we travel down to South Gyeongju, uh, Busan. We just arrived back to Seoul last yeah. night. Um, but most impo important things we uh, empathize on when we create the itinerary mm -hmm. is helping adoptee finding who they are, where they came from. So we we visit we get to visit adoption agencies, mm. and folks can review their adoption file and find just a little more information about themselves, you know, um, about their background information, just a little more information about their biological parents, uh -huh. um, where they came from, where they were born, the birth hospital, and some people get to meet their foster mom, mm -hmm. someone who loved them before they were placed overseas oh. so they can love back to somebody else. Yes, I mean, visiting one's birth country must be an amazing experience. Uh, I guess an amazing journey to, mm -hmm. to also finding, I guess, your, your Korean identity, Absolutely. your identity. Yeah. Um, but I'd like to also ask you while we're on this topic, does, I guess, visiting one's birth culture and even roots mm -hmm. at times even evoke, you know, mixed emotions? Um, what kinds of reactions have you seen? If this is a first trip to mm -hmm. Korea, there's definitely culture shock, uh, you know, because, you know, most participants grew in Western culture. Mm -hmm. It's very different. Um, so seeing different, hearing different language, smelling different smell, mm -hmm. and seeing different, you know, people. But at the same time, there is a comfort of being surrounded by all Korean environment. Someone, uh, my adoptive friend, grew up in a town, only there were 500 people. And she and her uh, sister were only two people who were Asian, you oh, know. So, mm -hmm. you know, having grown such an you know, environment and being able to come and visit Korea when everybody <laughs> looked like Koreans, Asians, uh -huh. Uh -huh. there is uh, just amazing feeling of belonging mm -hmm. and fitting. Mm -hmm. Yet, they don't speak the same language. Right. So, just a lot of, you know, feelings come and go throughout the trip. Mm -hmm. So every year you see adoptees reuniting with their birth parents, mm -hmm. whether it's one or two, mm -hmm. um, wishing for more families reuniting. Absolutely. Um, this year I understand that two adult adoptees have reunited with their Korean uh, birth parents. Mm -hmm. uh, could you tell us about them? Yes, we had two reunions um, that happened a week ago. And, um, you know, I can't really tell you detail because the personal, right. their stories. Yes. But I can tell you this, um, reunion is initially quite, in, you know, um, intense mm -hmm. first few minutes because the birth family who carried uh, guilt for just a long time, you know, would express, you know, how much guilt, feel, guilty feeling they have had, mm -hmm. how sorry they are. So initially, you know, birth family repeats, you know, um, that please forgive me um, uh, for making adoption plan for you. And the adoptees, uh, you know, can comfort them. You know, I'm fine. Uh, I want you to live freely. Mm -hmm. um, so there is um, healing, uh, forgiveness, um, and mutual understanding. So I think it's just beautiful at towards the end. Of course, not all reunion works that way. Right. But um, Adoptees have reunited with the birth family. I find in them are much more peaceful stage, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. We have a special guest joining us today. Another special guest, of course. Uh, he's <laughs> waiting right over there. <laughs> Chris Poirier uh, here, is here today to share his story of, re of reuniting with his uh, parents, his birth parents. He'll be joining us on stage. So Chris, can you join us on stage, please? Hi, Chris. Uh, thanks for joining us on the show. Thank you for having me. Uh, would you like to introduce yourself to our viewers? Sure. So my name is Christopher Poirier. Um, some may know me as Chris Poirier Kim, or CPK for short, from some of the social media and media work that I've done. I was adopted when I was five months old from Seoul. Mm. And currently, I am a fitness entrepreneur and personal trainer from Boston, Massachusetts. Wow. Um, so do tell us, how and when did you finally get to meet your birth parents? So I was fortunate enough to meet my birth mother several months back mm. in the spring. And I actually owe that to Asia families because before I had always, for many years, had thoughts and desires at some point mm -hmm. to possibly search for my birth parents. And from the tour that we've been on, I was on here last year. Mm -hmm. And I did not realize that part of that was potentially 
um, reaching out and connecting you with your birth parents. And when I had found that out, um, it sparked this incredible fire in me um, to want to do that. Mm -hmm. Because before, again, I had no idea of how that would be possible or where to even begin. Mm -hmm. And now with the resources and, and opportunities I have, um, because of Age of Families, I was fortunate enough to do that. No, I read that at some stage, like you've mentioned, adopted children, uh, they do have this desire to meet their birth mother. Mm -hmm. And as they grow or, you know, after some time, some say maybe not, you know, that desire kind of disappears. But then yeah. again, for some, that interest kind of sparks and they, and they really, really want to seek for their birth parents, birth mother or birth father, birth families. So what was the reason for you, the biggest reason for you to actually uh, seek to meet your birth family? Oh, great question. Well, first, I think every adoptee story is different. Mm. And our timeline is different in terms of how we view our adoption and especially that desire to possibly meet um, our biological and birth families mm -hmm. as well. And for myself, it's something that it took many years to get to that point. Mm -hmm. For up until my mid-20s, I'm 29 right now, it was never even a reality for me. Mm -hmm. I'd say more so recently over the past several years, I've wanted to really explore my adoption mm -hmm. and how that has evolved, ended up evolving into wanting to meet uh, possibly my biological and birth family, if that mm -hmm. was possible. Many adoptees uh, feel in terms of belonging mm -hmm. um, really has a lot of effect on our perception of that and desire as well to meet. Mm -hmm. And you did mention something at having to prepare. There's so much to prepare for. Sure. Um, what may, could you give us a few examples? I basically meeting a stranger, mm -hmm. if you will. Mm -hmm. Even though I did meet my mother, we know little about each other mm -hmm. at the same time too. So this is our first uh, meeting. We may have seen pictures, but it's not even like, um, it's not as if there was any history that we could recall upon. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not as if we had known or heard stories of each other. It was our very first meeting as if we're meeting a brand new person, let alone our f only family. <laughs> and for myself, it was a lot of emotional preparing in the sense that uh -huh. yes. I don't know how this can go mm. because I have heard, and then there are many stories of these connections for birth families and adoptees that they're a mixed bag of emotions. Mm. Some are very positive, some can be negative. Uh -huh. um, and so for myself, I had to do a lot, of, I had to spend a lot of time making sure that I am at least guarded mm. on my own because I'm unsure of right. how this meeting uh -huh. could evolve. Uh -huh. So how has this meeting, uh, your reunion with your birth mother changed your life? What kinds of changes has it brought? Yeah, so me personally, it was the best experience uh, of my life. Uh -huh. I could not be happier with that. And I, and I think a lot of it is founded in something Grace was talking about earlier in terms of adoptees when they come here, mm -hmm. they see in their part of a culture of people that look like them when mm -hmm. we walk around. And to see really, not just someone that looks like me, that I look very much like almost identical to, <laughs> um, changed my life uh -huh. mm -hmm. because there was no, there was nothing I can reference mm. in my entire life um, that felt like that and felt like that connection because it's something that has to be truly experienced for the person. Now I've heard other stories of, of what had happened, but that's, and, and, and as much empathy that can be shown, it's completely different when you're in those shoes mm -hmm. and, you're, and you're in that energy and you're in that moment just like this, meeting that person. And for me, it was a, 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 it was a wholesomeness again that really made me feel complete as a person. Mm -hmm. And it's that aspect that as an adoptee that many of us may experience in terms of uh, having quote unquote missing piece mm -hmm. to us and it was the first time I felt complete. I'm so happy for you to hear that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, before we let you go, uh, would you like to maybe uh, share a message for the viewers that are watching right now? Yeah, sure, I'd love sure. to. Yes. So for anybody watching this, no matter where you are, I'd love to say something to all adoptees across the world, and that is, I truly hope that for anyone that sees this, 
that you continue to have a belief within yourself as an adoptee because as one of us, you have such a power to create your own identity and there's so much strength that comes with that. And I really hope that everyone out there, if you hear this once, then please, please, please just understand you are enough and as long as you put your mind to it and you believe in what you have, you will accomplish great things and you will feel complete within yourself. We're seeing more Korean families adopting children. Absolutely, uh, yeah. more people talking about it. You yes. know, um, just thinking seriously about adopting children mm -hmm. uh, much more than before. Let's say five yes. years ago, ten years yes. ago. But would you say that um, you know Koreans are ready? For it, I mean, I wouldn't say Koreans are totally ready mm -hmm. to openly adopt children uh, as a way of forming a family. Mm -hmm. um, but there are a good group of parents uh, who are opening, ch who who are practicing open adoption. Yes. Uh -huh. Open adoption means that you are telling your child mm -hmm. that he or she is adopted. Mm -hmm. Open adoption in U.S. is totally different concept. Open adoption in U.S. is you have ongoing communications oh, and interaction with the birth family uh -huh. so annually or every quarter. So the two concepts in two different countries, it's mm -hmm. same meaning, same mm -hmm. name, but it applies differently. But I am so encouraged to see that a bunch of uh, Korean parents uh, that are willing to promote domestic mm -hmm. adoption. And um, I think some adult adoptees also joined the campaign oh, you know, to promote uh -huh. domestic adoption in Korea. Which is a good time. Yes, yes. yes. Okay. But still, adoption agencies have a difficulty mm -hmm. to recruit and train domestic adoptive families I in see. Korea because Korean society thinks the bloodline is so important. Mm -hmm. So it hinders from people from people adopting. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd like to ask, what led you to establish Asia families? When I was young, I wanted to save the world, you know, change the world and change life. Uh -huh. I wanted to go and serve in a refugee camp mm. when there's, you know, people are lacking basic needs. Um, but I couldn't really get into the field. And this local adoption agency in Maryland was seeking a social worker, like urgently, someone who speaks both languages. So I applied and they wanted to hire me on at the interview. Uh -huh. So I kind of accidentally got involved with the adoption field and I worked for adoption agency about seven years mm -hmm. and my job was doing post-adoption services. Ah. So not, a, not much on pre-adoption, but supporting the children and family after adoption is finalized. So what were your responsibilities? What so uh, mostly what I do, I used to do it for adoption agency. Uh -huh. So I ran at the time weekly Korean, lang Korean culture school every mm -hmm. Saturday. Uh, we organized the Korean culture school, um, ran the camps, uh -huh. culture camps, um, also did social gatherings like Lunar New Year celebration, Chuseok celebrations, mm -hmm. also organized the Birthland tours at the time. And one day I was reading a Korean newspaper and read an article about an uh, adoptee whose name is Daniel. And I knew him, his family, and mm -hmm. I was you know, involved with their adoption journey. And I heard, I saw the article, it said he was murdered uh, oh. in my area, in a Maryland area. And it really broke me deeply. Um, you know, I wanted to, it kind of ignited my desire and passion uh, to do something to, you know, to love and serve Korean adoptees. Mm -hmm. And through some consultations and prayers, um, we, I, you know, we, I founded the nonprofit organization called Asia mm -hmm. or Asia Families. 
Um, now we are slowly approaching the end of our show, but I'd like to ask you um, about some of the adoptees. Uh, do are, are you seeing more and more of these adoptees uh, hoping to settle down in Korea, you know, return to Korea, Absolutely. and you know, yes, settling down here? Yes. So yes. does it happen quite often? I, I'm seeing more and more, more, more. as you said. Uh -huh. um, maybe it's because Korea is more known to mm -hmm. the world. Uh, through K-pop, K-music, oh. um, so it's making living in Korea attractive, mm -hmm. and because um, they lost, you know, and after traveling first time in Korea, you wonder what it like to be living in Korea. Oh. You know, if I weren't adopted, you know, mm -hmm. what it like to be in a, in Korea. So it's intriguing for um, some adoptees, and mm -hmm. they end up moving. I know there are at least 400 to 500 adult adoptees mm -hmm. living in Seoul. And so. hopefully that number will grow. <laughs> it looks like it. You know, people sh you know, sh express this interest, mm -hmm. you know, if there are opportunities for employment and housing sure. and things like that. Uh -huh. And Korea is a wonderful place to live. Yes. <laughs> now we're down to our final question. Um, I'd like to ask uh, you about your aspirations for the future. And if you have a message you would like to deliver uh, to our viewers that are watching right now as founder and executive director of Asia Families. Uh, yes, take Thank it away. Thank you. Um, I have, I did my best to love adoptees and I uh, I will continue to do so. That's my aspiration. I don't want to talk about, oh, we want to do, expand our services, mm. do great things. But, um, you know, what we did, little things that helps adoptees, we will continue to do that to support their journey. And for the listeners, um, if you know an adoptee, you know, reach out to them and offer, you know, you know, resources, um, information, you know, invite them to be, you know, part of the community wherever they are, you know. Although you said we don't, I don't want to say that I want to expand and do this and this, this. You already are doing beautiful things. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Now, today we will be closing our show with messages from Carrie Nelson and Sean Truman who are still on their journey to finding their Korean birth families. Um, so please stay tuned to our program until the very, very end. And Grace, thank you so much for joining thank us you. today. Thank <laughs> you. My name is Sean, and my Korean name was Kim Sung Il. I was adopted between the age of three and four to a family in Michigan. I was adopted through social welfare services. I actually only have one memory from Korea. Um, I remember sleeping next to a TV, and there was actually a boy on the other side of the TV that used to sleep there, and they used to play cowboy movies. But that's the only thing I remember from my time in Korea. Honestly, I don't think there's anything I want to say. I would just want to do like every other son and give my mom a hug. Hello, my name is Carrie Nelson. My Korean name given to me at the orphanage was Lee Eun Sun. And I was adopted when I was seven months old, just a baby, to a family in Minnesota in the United States. Um, I was adopted through the whole agency uh, to an orphanage south of Taejin City. It's closed. Bethel Gardens was the name of it. I don't remember anything from when I was in Korea. I wish I could. <laughs> I want to say um, thank you for opening your heart and finding a home for a baby that you couldn't take care of. It's hard and I am an adult and I understand adult decisions. I want you to know that if you ever worried or wondered about this baby, that is a good life for me and I've had a good life, but it's okay if you never worried or wondered too, it's okay. I understand. Thank you for your generosity in allowing a baby to find a home. Um, I would like to say a very sincere thank you to the Korean people for being a country that cared enough about babies to find babies' homes, even if it wasn't here in Korea. Thank you for that. I would like to say um, that if you wonder what to say to an adoptee, if you meet an adoptee, 
All you have to say is welcome to Korea. Welcome back. It's okay, and thank you for coming to visit. And I would also like to ask people in Korea, when you know there is a mom who's single, to give your love to her and find your heart and show her love. I think it must be hard.